You know, why is it that Muslims can, you know, spread the religion, do da'wah, you know, on street corners and give out flyers and, you know, make videos and criticize and debate. But when someone wants to speak against Islam, Muslims get offended and say, oh, don't, don't, um, not all Muslims, of course, but people get offended and say, you shouldn't criticize Islam. You know, this is my way of life. This is my religion. But the thing is, I believe that if you want to live in a, in a world where everyone is, you know, free to practice their own religion, you should give people the right to, to criticize. If you want to promote your way of life, then you should let other people promote their way of life too. Um, despite all the investment I put into it, you know, emotional investment and, um, you know, my, my personality, my friends, you know, everything was Islam to me. So this was a huge loss, you know, losing God. And uh, some people want to know what I believe now. I personally don't believe there's any God, uh, so I'm atheist. Uh, so I'm atheist. Assalamu alaikum. I received a question that I receive quite often. And uh, because it seems to be a common theme, I decided to choose this particular one and read it out and see what kind of commentary that I can provide. Maybe it will help some people. Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad. Uh, and this question comes from uh, a brother named Adil. Begins with Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad. Wa alaikum salam. I hope you are well. I've been a reader of your work for quite some time, over three years actually. May Allah reward you. Based on some of your posts, I wanted to ask for your advice on some issues I've been having which have been causing me a lot of grief recently. Alhamdulillah, I'm better than I was some time ago, but the issues still exist. Essentially, I've had doubts which have escalated in recent times, which have really began to affect my khushu'a in salah, the quality of my dhikr, and my iman generally. Some of these doubts are somewhat rational like doubts about veracity of our rational faculty, history, and evolution. But some are just stupid, yet they somehow affect me. It's not just one doubt, but new doubts come here and there, and each time they cause me problems, go away, and a new one comes a while later. Alhamdulillah, I've been able to study Aqidah at a basic level with teachers, which is advice I've heard in relation to such issues. I asked my Sheikh for advice on this matter and he advised me to read Deliverance from Error by Imam al-Ghazali. You've, you've mentioned it in your post also. It was tremendous help, alhamdulillah, and benefited me. I don't want to make this long-winded, so he is what, here, here is one section. I think that was a spelling error, but anyway. So he is one, here is one section. He in one section talks about how if he wants... If one wants a sure knowledge of the Prophet Muhammad's prophethood, he talked about reflection on the seerah, the Qur'an, the miracles at his hands, his prophecies, and so on. And making sure one does not rely on one example or mode of proof, but make them numerous. I tried to apply his advice and researched, this topics for, uh, researched these topics for some time, and this also helped me greatly. He also discusses, if I understand it correctly, reaching a higher level of certainty following the way of the Sufis. The thing is I feel as though my spiritual practices are struggling because of these doubts, and hence it's hard for me right now to go down that path. I feel as though I need some basic level of yaqeen first. Despite the improvements, I still find myself vulnerable to these doubts. They still affect me, affect how I feel in my heart, and hence my worship. What advice would you give for me? Sometimes I feel like my foundation, which is perhaps faulty, but other times, when I see the non-rational or very weak nature of the thoughts causing me to doubt, sometimes I think it has something to do with ignoring the waswas of shaitan. I really appreciate your assistance in this matter. Jazakumullahu khair. Adil. This issue of yaqeen and doubt and uh, spiritual development of a person, um, one of the... I think problematic ways of uh, ways that we tend to approach it is that many of us tend to think that we need to have either some level of certainty. Nobody really says what level is like. Is it um, you know what measure? Is it what kind of concentration of yaqeen does your body have or your heart need to have for you to feel like you're getting something out of it? I'm not really sure. 
what that entails. But it, it's always mentioned that many people look for a particular level of certainty, a particular level where their doubts are subsisting before they feel some spiritual enlightenment out of it. The thing is, just by virtue of being alive, you're always going to be in this constant state of flux. Um, there is a, a, a hadith that's narrated by Imam Muslim. And it's, uh, uh, Hanbala was a, a, a scribe for the Prophet, peace be upon him. He used to write. And I mean, imagine the type of position and the type of certainty someone would attain if they happen to be the scribe for the Prophet ﷺ. I mean, you can't get any closer than that. Like you're someone who's writing down the revelation. Yet, Hanzala meets Abu Bakr as-Siddiq anhu one time as he's walking. And Abu Bakr asks, asked him, how are you doing? And he said, I'm a hypocrite. Nafaqa Hanzala. It's a very famous hadith. And Abu Bakr Siddiq was like, whoa, what happened? What's wrong? And he said, well, I just realized when I'm with the Prophet wasallam, I have such certainty in everything. I have no doubts about anything. It's as if I see heaven and hell. It's as if I see the metaphysical realities bear witness. You know, I bear witness them right before me. But then I go home and I'm with my wife and my children and I forget all that and I get caught up in the dunya, I get caught up in this life. And so he was having trouble with this dual states that he was experiencing that seemed contradictory to him. And Abu Bakr was taken aback by that and he said, then I'm a hypocrite too, because I experienced the same thing. Nevertheless, they both said, all right, let's just go to the Prophet and tell him. And when they went to him, the Prophet said, if you guys maintained your states of certainty, this utter certainty that you have with me. If you maintained it outside and all the time, the angels will start shaking your hands on the, in the streets. But an hour and an hour. Sa'atan wa sa'a. There is a time for this and a time for that. Um, you're not supposed to be always, you know, you have you should always have a projection upwards in your spiritual development, but that projection. Don't think that it's going to be in a straight line. You're going to elevate and then you're going to have a dip. But then after that dip, you're going to have another elevation and then you're going to have another dip. But every dip that you have throughout this path should be a little bit higher, should get you, you shouldn't go so low that you go back to the very beginning. If you reflect on your own spiritual development today, you're not in the same position as you were last year. I guarantee you that. You really have to reflect on the overall journey that you're having. Um, this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Mulk, He has created life and death to test you. Um, in Surah uh, Al-Ankabut, Allah says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَن يُتْرَكُوا أَن يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Do people think that they were going to be left alone just by saying we believe and they're not going to be tested. And this testing can come in different forms. It could come in financial, it could come in uh, social, it could come even in your own heart. You have these little states of turbulence, which as you mentioned, Imam al-Ghazali had. I should correct something about um, uh, what you uh, said about Imam al-Ghazali, or not so much correct, but maybe elaborated a little bit for you. Um, not sure if you caught that or not, but... Imam al-Ghazali does state that you should look at the seerah of the Prophet, the Qur'an, the miracles, but the reason that you believe in his prophecy, the reason you accept it, and if you recall in Deliverance from Error, Imam al-Ghazali talks about how people have different access to different realms of knowledge. So if you accept, for example, just to give you an analogy here, um, let's say that you're not in medical school, you're not a physician, there are some people who study medicine and they're physicians and you go to them. You notice that when the physician tells you to do something or to take a particular drug or anything like that, the only things you need to know that they're a physician and they're qualified is you see their degrees on the wall and you see their license to practice from the College of Physicians and the board that they are certified by in whatever country or state that you reside in. You see that on the wall. But you don't spend 
your time going after their education route, looking into their history, trying to find out what their grades were, trying to find out how they performed in all of their exam. I mean, you don't you don't spend your time doing that. You just trust that this is a physician who's qualified, who's licensed, certified by the board of other physicians who recognize this person's authority and they accept it. And the way you test if that physician is actually good and knows what they're talking about is by applying what they're telling you to do. So if they tell you, take this medicine and you'll feel better, or go do this test, or change your diet in this way, or I need you to do these particular things over the next three, four weeks or whatever, and then come back and do another blood work, and then you see the improvement. You didn't actually go and investigate every little thing about that physician. You just applied their teaching to you and you experience the benefit and that gives you the certainty in them. That's not to say that you shouldn't focus on studying the seerah of the Prophet. Of course you should and you should learn about the Prophet and that how you increase love for him. But if I'm addressing the point of you looking for certainty. Imam al-Ghazali noticed that when he talks about the Sufis, he's talking about taking the prophetic teachings and applying them and focusing on improving his character and purifying his heart. And he mentioned in Deliverance from Error that he's read all of their works. He's read all the books. He's read all the commentaries. From a cognitive perspective, intellectually speaking, he understood all of that. But he recognized that what they were telling him to do were things that he had to experience for himself. And that's when he finally gained that certainty and peace of heart and peace in his heart. So for you, and you know, and this is really advice I tell myself before I tell anybody else, but it's a good reminder that, that, you know, we sometimes get caught up in life and we get caught up in all the drama and all the things that we get into. We get caught up with all of our studies. We get caught up in Aqidah discussions and, and, and learning and whatnot. And we tend to forget what all of this is really about. Um, in Surah Al-Shu'ara, Allah says, يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا منت الله بقلب سليم. On a day when no wealth nor children will benefit except for the one who comes to God with a sound heart. And for you to come with a sound heart, you need to work on yourself. Now, you want to get a basic level of yaqeen first? You already have that. The very fact that you're asking these questions and this is one of the things that really escapes many people. When you're asking the question, you're already acknowledging. You're already accepting the reality, the certainty, the, the metaphysical presence that you're questioning. You, in order for you to question it, you have to accept that it exists in front of you, that you're experiencing it. So you're actually experiencing the metaphysics of and the spiritual issues that you're having, you're experiencing and you're tasting it. You're, you're trying to gain an access to it at a higher level. And the only way for you to get to that higher level of certainty that you're looking for is really, first of all, you have to have patience. Because, you know, you look at, I mean, we, we usually tend to focus on, we look at when, when, whenever we see somebody famous or we see somebody who's successful or we see a sheikh or we see uh, someone who we believe to be very spiritual, we really just see the end result at that moment. That's what we're witnessing. But we don't get to see the time that they spend behind closed doors, away from the public eye, working on themselves, working and perfecting the thing that made them who they are. You go to a concert, for example, say a pianist, and you watch this pianist improvise and just do beautiful work, beautiful, beautiful recital. You, you didn't see the hours that pianist spent practicing in his house and the hours spent with the teacher. You didn't see that. And had you seen that, you wouldn't really see the genius, actually. If you listen to people, I mean, I, 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 I know if I've seen people practice and just the, the countless hours they spend just practicing a set of notes where it's just repetitive and you don't really experience the harmony and the art from it. It, it gets annoying, actually. For the listener. So what does that tell you about the one doing it? The, the frustration of having to repeat the same movement over and over and over and over. But after a time, when they go up on stage and they start to perform, all of a sudden this beautiful melody comes out and this beautiful play. And it just you, you, you now enjoy it. And they show you 
what they've practiced in pieces, the end result of it. Same thing goes with scholars, same thing goes with spiritual people, people that have this yaqeen, this certainty. I mean, I know an uncle um, at the masjid. I deliberately, when I was uh, at the end of the prayer on Jum'ah, we deliver, many of us actually, we would go to this uncle. And this man must be like, I don't know, 80 years old or something, an old man. But as soon as he would touch you, you felt this electricity. And it wasn't an electrical shock just from, you know, grounding or anything like that it's a spiritual electricity and he had this and we just wanted him to pray for us because we just saw it. but this man has been doing this for so many years and this is the culmination of it now we're seeing the final you know this is how many years of building up the spiritual power same thing for you i don't know how old you are um i'm assuming that you're on the younger side um it's it's gonna take time man you're just gonna have to Take your time, be patient. And what you need to do, by the way, is, and, and recognize that you're not unique. It's not bad to have these doubts. I mean, there's another hadith where the companions uh, stated explicitly that they have some thoughts that came to them that they would prefer that they would fall from the heavens than to utter them with their tongues. And so this is something that it's a human phenomenon and it's okay to have and it's fine. And yes, you should ignore shaitan uh, whisperings. That's, that goes without saying. But recognize that this is something that's going to take you some time. Uh, what I would recommend that you should do right now is, first of all, accept that you're going to have ups and downs because you're a human being and you're not going to be constant. Second of all, recognize that this is a journey a long lifelong journey that is not going to end until you actually die third of all have a constant wird you know uh, there is a recording i put out a few years ago it's al wird al latif so like in the morning uh, there is a wird where you can just recite surah yasin and then do this dhikr um, if you want something a little bit upper, you know, increase it up a little bit, you can add a hizb, you know, half a juz that you recite right after these, uh, after this word. Whatever it is, you should pick, take something that you know you can maintain. You know, let's say that it takes you 15 minutes in the morning to do, and you know that you can dedicate that time to it, and you make sure that you don't ever leave it. Even when you're feeling a little bit low on energy, you know that this is your bare minimum baseline that you have to perform. The times when you're feeling high spiritual energy, add to it a little bit and do a little bit more. Recite more Quran, do more dhikr, do whatever. When you're feeling that spiritual high. But when you're feeling you're just a little bit down, make sure that you overcome your ego and you say, this is my baseline, it is non-negotiable. Come hell or high water, as they would say, this is going to get done, no matter what. If you have, let's say, Surah Yasin and Al-Wurd Al-Latif, or just Al-Wurd Al-Latif after Subh, you're going to do it, no matter what. Even if you're in a rush, you're going to do it while you're driving, or while you're on the bus, you're going to recite these things, you're, get, you're just going to do it, you're going to get it done. When you maintain that baseline to the point where you cannot function normally without doing it, then you will notice over time that it just comes to you naturally and your spiritual state will improve. That certainty you're looking for will come to you. The other advice I have for you is you need to recite Quran more. These are the words of God. Um, you really need to get intimate with them. The words of Allah, when they start to get into your heart, whether you understand them or not, you know, I mean, you should try to understand the words and study and all of that. But just the act of recitation itself, this is the spiritual food. You know, the body has its own sustenance. You eat, you take vitamins, you, you, know, you train, you do these things, you rest, you do these things to give nourishment to the body. Well, the spiritual heart, the nourishment for the spiritual heart is the remembrance of God. And there is no better remembrance of God than to recite the words of God. And you need to have a daily portion of the Quran even if it's just five verses where you just make it a deal with yourself and you say these are going to be I'm just going to do this so that you at least have a continuous attempt to do a khatam a completion of the Quran outside of Ramadan even it's a uh, it's unfortunate that for us Muslims we tend to focus on the Quran usually just once a year in Ramadan and we compete on how many khatams we do the Quran should be your 
food for the soul on a daily basis, 365 days a year. So these are just some thoughts uh, I thought I should record for you and, and maybe for anybody else that's having these types of questions. I, I really want to emphasize uh, that it's not bad to have doubts. It's natural to have doubts. Um, and if you have questions, you should ask questions and you should seek knowledge. Um, but you should also recognize that your spirit requires certain sustenance, sustenance. And this sustenance comes in certain ways, which I just mentioned. Um, and yeah, learn about the Prophet Wasallam, but more importantly, live like the Prophet. And once you actually adopt the practices, as Imam al-Ghazali had done, that's when you really attain that certainty that goes beyond any cognitive intellectual debates or discussions you might have. I hope that helps you out, bro. Um, you know, I try to keep it short so it's not too um, overbearing on you. Uh, just uh, please keep us in your du'a. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi